Hello, I'm Alec Avdikov, and welcome to the life and times of Frederick the Great. So, before I go straight into the content of the podcast, I must do a bit of what my teacher called housekeeping. I must say, I was surprised that my mom managed to stay awake throughout my last podcast. It means a lot to me that I'm getting a lot of support from my friends and family. My dad brought up a good question to me when he heard the podcast. He asked, where's Froderick? Froderick, as in Froderick Frankenstein from the young Dr. Frankenstein. Go give that a watch. And also Frederick, meaning Frederick the Great. My retort to that is... I need to do a whole bunch of context before I start on his life. The context and time in which he lived had so many different twists and turns that it needs to be backed up with a great deal of backstory before I begin with his life. My goal is to make it to 10 episodes to see how this does. If I make good progress and I have a genuine audience that wants to listen, then I will continue. That is my main goal, to get an audience that actually cares. After all, as far as niche history goes, Frederick the Great is very obscure. But if Zach Twomley can make a series about the Thirty Years' War, a podcast which I highly recommend, uh, when diplomacy fails, go get a, go give it a listen, then I believe I can make a series about Frederick the Great Bible, even if I don't have a cool Irish accent. Last episode. I discussed what greatness is and how it should really mean remembered. The Holy Roman Empire and all of its convoluted twists and turns, such as imperial elections. I also briefly mentioned the question of religion regarding the Peace of Augsburg. And finally, I led you into the Thirty Years' War. But first I must do something that I neglected to do the last episode. I never told you about the geography of Prussia. I got so caught up with explaining the Holy Roman Empire that geography totally slipped my mind. In short, Brandenburg, the core territory of Prussia, was poor. Very poor. Like, near the lowest standards of Europe at the time, poor. Consider how poor we think Africa is today. And that is how the French in the 1600s would consider the people of Brandenburg. I'm going to quote our man, Frederick the Great, in a letter to Voltaire, a French philosopher who lived in Frederick's palace for a time. Apart from Libya, there are few states that can equal ours when it comes to sand. The electorate of Brandenburg had poor soil for agriculture, when nearly the entire population depended on agriculture or subsistence farming. This was a swampy, sandy, barren little place in which little grew and people would not expect that an eventual metropolis would be there 300 years later. I'm going to quote a historian about the state of Brandenburg in the early 1600s, Margaret Shannon and the rise of Brandenburg Prussia. Meanwhile, the core state of Brandenburg was still comparatively poor. Its towns were small by Western European standards and its commerce less developed. With the terrain of sandy heath interspersed with swamp, there was a natural shortage of fertile agricultural land and mineral deposits. The total population was about 270,000, considerably less than Prussia's 400,000. Berlin, the capital, had a mere 12,000 inhabitants. Despite being an electorate, Brandenburg Prussia lacked the substance of a unified state. It was particularly vulnerable in time of war. This was an absolute fact that Prussia was vulnerable during war. Their borders lay entirely within the Northern European plain that stretches from Northern France all the way east to the vast unending steppes of Russia. Therefore, there is no natural barrier that can stop any pillaging army through your lands. <clears throat> Gustavus Adolphus, I'm looking at you. <clears throat> oh, excuse me, wrong in my throat. <clears> throat> Although, there really isn't that much to pillage in the first place. I want to paint a mental image of what soldiers were going through as they, pa- as they were passing through these lands. It's an early morning spring, 
and you shiver in the cold. Your shoes are soaking right into your socks. You have been walking in the sand for the past week through bogs that go up to your neck. Imagine a haunted swamp in which fog is all around you and you can hardly see five feet in front of you. The tree you hold on to for balance is covered in moss, so you wipe your hands from the gunk, but it sticks to your hands. Your feet are all pruny and wet from the sand that you walk through, and you're going to get foot fungus, commonly known as trench foot. Yikes. This reminds me of a cold Everglade, and I personally think this sounds miserable, and I would want to go home. This land is what the Hohenzollern family, the dynasty from Frederick the Great came from, would reign over from 1411 until 1918, when the German imperial monarchy fell after their defeat in World War I. The Margrave of Brandenburg, when the Thirty Years' War began, was Georg Wilhelm. He was considered a weak ruler because his country was stomped all over in the Thirty Years' War. Now let's quote another historian, Christopher Clark, from the book The Iron Kingdom. At critical moments during the conflict, Brandenburg faced impossible choices. Its fate hung entirely on the will of others. The elector was unable to guard his borders. I keep talking about the Thirty Years' War, but why does it matter to the story of Frederick the Great? I mean, the war began 96 years before he was actually born. I shall quote Frederick himself in response to this argument. He wrote that the lands were devastated during the Thirty Years' War, whose imprint was so profound that its traces can still be discerned as I write. Its already low population was depopulated further by the continental-wide war. The Hohenzollern family realm was this disconnected mess of territories that was impossible to defend without a professional army, which it lacked at the time. By the end of Georg Wilhelm's reign in 1640, the army was a mercenary force of 4,500 men, a piddly little thing. Brandenburg, Prussia was surrounded by the Dutch and French to the west, the Sweden and Denmark from the north, Austria, Bavaria, and Saxony from the south, and Poland and Russia from the east. If you look at a map of Europe from 1618, you will see how screwed Brandenburg was in the Thirty Years' War. But how did the Thirty Years' War start? What happened? Well, it started in 1618, when Bohemia wanted to elect Frederick V of the Rhine Palatinate to be their king instead of Habsburg Ferdinand II. The Habsburgs felt threatened by Frederick because he was a Protestant, and they wanted to keep the position of the Holy Roman Emperor Catholic, and specifically in Habsburg hands. And having Frederick be the king of Bohemia, now Czechia, was unthinkable to them. Bohemia was an electorate, meaning that they could elect the emperor. And if Bohemia wasn't ruled by the Habsburgs, then Ferdinand <gasps> might not be emperor. So when Frederick was like, sure, I'll be king, Ferdinand was all like, like heck you are. So they went to war and Frederick got completely crashed at the Battle of White Mountain. A much more exciting battle name than the event deserved, as Frederick was totally, completely crushed. Eventually, the Danish wanted to get involved in 1625 because they had holdings in the Holy Roman Empire and they felt threatened about the rise of Habsburg power. But they also got crushed by Habsburg forces. Throughout this time, Brandenburg had the brilliant strategy of putting their head in the sand like an ostrich and hoping nobody noticed. Hmm. See, the elector Georg Wilhelm thought that it was a proficient to have a policy of armed neutrality without an army. Instead of armies respecting the rights of their sovereignty, Brandenburg was simply walked over as if they were nothing. This was a time in which armies were the law and might made right. This would further be proved by the two opposing giants of the Thirty Years' War when they waltzed upon the our ballroom of history, Albrecht Wenzel Eusebius von Wallenstein and King Gustavus Adolphus of Sweden.
I will simply call him Wallenstein and Gustavus. Wallenstein enters our story first when he became the generalissimo of the Imperial Army in the name of Ferdinand II to combat the Danes in 1625. The Habsburg cause was at its height when they crushed the Dane expedition following multiple battles in 1626 and Wallenstein began to extort villages of Brandenburg for money. See, the soldiers at the time were known as Landsknechts, or servants of the land. Essentially, these were mercenaries who were paid off by an individual. It was not like how it is today, where a central government pays and feeds its soldiers and the loyalty is to the state. Instead, the soldiers had to depend on one of two things the pay of some rich individual, such as Wallenstein, or group of individuals, or they would have to live off the land, meaning that they would steal food and money from the population that they were quartered in. There was great torture and pillaging by both Protestant and Habsburg sides of the war. A great deal of pillaging happened when the Swedes, led by Gustavus Adolphus, came into town in 1630. When the Habsburgs at at the height of their power in the mid-1620s, the Swedes started to think that the Habsburgs were getting too powerful, and they had to deal with the French that the Swedes would receive money for them to put soldiers in the field. Even though the French were Catholic, they still did not trust the Catholic Habsburgs. <laughs> I won't fully go into every single siege and battle of the Thirty Years' War, but I will tell you that once Gustavus of Sweden started to get more successful in Germany, he completely disregarded Georg Wilhelm's policy of armed neutrality when King Gustavus said, I don't want to hear or know anything about neutrality. The elector has to be friend or foe. When I come to his borders, he must declare himself cold or hot. This is a fight between God and the devil. The Catholic forces sacked, destroyed, and massacred the city of Magdeburg while the Swedes were negotiating an alliance between themselves and Brandenburg. Magdeburg was a fortified city that was within the Hohenzollern family domain. Therefore, it was a personal blow to Georg Wilhelm when the news arrived that not only had it been destroyed, but its people were massacred. Some accounts, up to 20,000 people died, and a population of 25,000. This eventually led Georg Wilhelm changing from armed neutrality to allying himself with Sweden. Gustavus was behaving like a wolf in these negotiations, acting brashly, aggressively, and having the troops and artillery to back this up. Brandenburg, and specifically Georg Wilhelm, was the sheep utterly defenseless against the might of the wolves that surrounded him. Now to once more quote Christopher Clark, because he can explain what happened in the following years far better than I ever could. In June 1631, Georg Wilhelm reluctantly signed a pact with Sweden under which he agreed to open the fortress of Schwandau, just north of Berlin, and Kusrin in the Neumark to Swedish troops and to pay the Swedes a, month a monthly contribution of 30,000 thalers. The pact with Sweden proved as short-lived as the earlier alliance with the emperor. In 1631 through 32, the balance of power was tilting in favor of the Protestant forces as the Swedes and their Saxon allies swept deep into south and west of Germany, inflicting heavy defeats on the imperial side. By the end of 1634, after a serious defeat at Nordlingen, Sweden's ascendancy was broken. Exhausted by the war and desperate to drive a wedge between the Protestant princes, Ferdinand II seized the moment to offer moderate peace terms. Thank you very much, Christopher Clark. Iron Kingdom, give it a read if you're interested in Prussian history. All of this back and forth between the imperial forces and Swedish meant that Brandenburg was the front line of the fighting. And since I said earlier that the soldiers were poorly paid and fed, as well as they were disciplined harshly, they took it out on the population. The next minute will be rather gruesome as far as 
what happened to the poor people of Brandenburg. But I want to preserve history because I believe I must include it. According to Joseph Berg in an article about atrocities in the Thirty Years War, the evidence of the desolation is staggering. Thirty years of fighting, sieges, plunder, plague, and instability left the area today we call Germany with possibly a third of its population dead from starvation and disease, crops ravaged, entire villages and towns obliterated, and a defunct economy. When soldiers went through a town, they often destroyed property, raped women, and stole food and money from the population, leading them to starve. In some cases, there was cannibalism. When the population was left in such a nu nutritionally weak state, they were further subjected to disease, such as smallpox and the Black Death. Yes, the Black Death. The worst story by far is what I heard from Christopher Clark's book, and skip ahead about 40 seconds if you're a squeamish. You ready? All right. Another man by the name of Kruger Müller was caught by Imperial soldiers, bound hand and foot, and roasted over a fire until he revealed the whereabouts of his money. But no sooner had he had his tormentors taken the money and gone than another raiding party of Imperials arrived in the town. Hearing their colleagues had already roasted a hundred thalers out of Müller, they carried him back to the fire and held his face in the flames, roasting him for so long that he died of it and his skin came off like that of a slaughtered goose. Good luck sleeping tonight. I know I won't. As a side piece of information, talers were the money that was used in the Holy Roman Empire. A horse at that time was worth 20 talers. Therefore, when the Imperial soldiers extorted 100 talers from poor Mula, it was most likely his entire life savings. These atrocities, as well as his inability to get the Swedes out of Brandenburg in the last four years of his reign, even having to flew, flee to Ducal Prussia, is why Georg Wilhelm is considered to be a weak ruler. Margaret Shannon states that Georg Wilhelm was certainly timid and indecisive, and he had few military or diplomatic gifts. However, he was faced with an impossible situation. He was stuck between two great powers butting their heads in his land without any resources to combat it. He was certainly no great ruler, but he did his best in an absolutely horrifying situation. I mean, could you do any better? He eventually gave up governing and put all his administrative power into his chief minister, Schwarzenberg, in 1637, and died in Königsberg in 1640. All in all, to some of his reign, I would say, wrong place, wrong time. He simply had no good luck and was plagued by the powers around him, treating him like trash. Well, here we are, 1640, at the death of the Elector Georg Wilhelm. In a time of death, misery, and despair is where I shall leave you at. Sometimes in stories, there are no happy endings, only sad, harsh reality. But I will leave you off with a bit of hope. In the Netherlands, there was a young man being educated and looking at the situation of Brandenburg like a hawk. He believes that there is a mighty future for this sand-ridden, swampy place. His name is Frederick Wilhelm. He will be known as the Great Elector, and he will be the main focus of our next podcast. Again, I would like to thank you all for your kind support for this project of mine. And I believe that I will continue to follow this passion of mine for a very long time. I shall conclude in a different way this week, and I shall steal the words of Consuela Mack from Consuela Mack Wealth Track and say, I am wishing you all a healthy, productive, and profitable week ahead.